and the interviews keep on coming and uh, introducing my next guest waiting on in the wings i'm pleased to announce that uh, we have american based singer songwriter multi-instrumentalist michael botte how are we doing Hey, Danny, it's good to meet you, brother. I am doing great. Thank you so much for doing this. I know we took some time to schedule this, but I'm happy we did it. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, we're here now, so that's the main thing. And uh, Michael Botte, that's a great name. And you also play with a band as well. Uh, the band? Yeah. So um, do you, um, do you, do you, are you a solo musician? And do you also play with a band as well? Oh, yeah. So what, what's interesting is that the Michael Bate band, as we know it, is really me and my producer, uh, Bob Beals from Sound Foundation Studios, who make every sound that you hear. It's the two of us that make that sound. So really, that's the band. I don't have a local band, but I could get a local band very easily to do some some gigs. But right now, it's just the two of us and we are making music and having so much fun together. Gotcha. So a bit of a dynamic duo then. <laughs> exactly exactly if you i'll take that i'll take that <laughs> that's good and uh, michael can you tell me um where are you currently situated so i live outside of philadelphia pennsylvania which is about an hour and a half or two hours south of new york city a lot of people overseas know new york city i'm a little bit south uh philadelphia pennsylvania oh about an hour from the shore from the beach an hour and a half two hours from new york city Oh, that's great. I did some research and they call um, Pennsylvania the Keystone State. Is that right? Keystone State in Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. And we all know where Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, they've exported some great music over the years and the decades. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, one of the biggest acts, I mean, back in the 70s, I mean, Hall and Oates, you know, Daryl Hall and John Oates. Philadelphia born and bred they're one of the biggest ones from back in the 70s but there's been a lot of you know a lot yeah. of bands but they were one of the bigger ones back in the day and you're not too far from Ohio as well so Ohio is the next state over so for me to get to Ohio it's about a five and a half hour maybe six hour drive it's oh. due west yeah yeah bit the way then yeah that's where my producer actually lives in Ohio so he and I live about I don't know, eight or nine hours or something apart. It's the funniest thing. We've made so much music together. We've never sat in a room together. We do everything virtually, just kind of like how we're doing. I record locally here. He records there. And we send files back and forth. Hey, this is 2024. And that's just kind of how things are done sometimes. Oh, it's amazing how technology has progressed, like, say, the past five to 10 years. Yeah, it, it allows for people to do things like this. I mean, it's unfortunate that we live so far away. I would love to sit with him, but we just, we fit so well together. I mean, we just, we're doing a lot together and we just fit. And it's unfortunate that we live far away, but that should not be a barrier to yeah. what we're doing, right? So with technology, local studios, we're able to accomplish what we're doing. That's understandable. Sometimes when I meet my guests like, in person, it feels like I know them because I know it's virtual, but having that connection, I feel yeah. like I know them. It's quite, um, not strange, but uh, unique in a way. Yeah. Right. And so just talk, talked about you geographically, like your background, where you're situated. Um, can you tell me how long you have been like making music for? Yeah, I guess. Well, I guess I've been writing. I've been writing and playing for decades. I mean, Gosh, one of the songs that I released last year called My Way was actually written about 25 years ago, and I finally released it a year ago. So that'll tell you, I've had quite a few songs sitting in the book, if you will, hmm. for a very long time. But but to be honest, I never really tried anything for real musically until COVID quarantine. And you've probably heard the story before. I wasn't traveling for work. Things were shut down. I had a lot of time on my hands. So I finally learned how to make demos and record and uh, you know, send demos out. So even though I've been writing and playing for decades, I never recorded a note in my life until mm. 2020. And that's when I met my producer. And that's when all this kind of got started. So it's really only been, you know, about four years. But man, I feel like I've I've done so much in the last four years. It's mm. been a pretty good ride. Okay. Um, but yeah, thanks. I guess thanks to COVID quarantine, if there's something positive that came yeah. out of COVID, the Michael Bate band was born. And you've heard this story before, I'm sure. Yeah. I know the very early 2020s are unprecedented times, but what come out of it, as you say, uh, people had a lot of time on their hands to kind of like find their direction with their music as well. Yeah, it was amazing. I mean, it's always been in me, I guess, but I just, I never had the time to try to pursue it. So I guess if there's one positive, and COVID, of course, was unkind to many people in different mm -hmm. ways. And to be honest, 
it was very, very unkind to my family. And a lot of the songs that I wrote were about our time at COVID. But if there is a positive, you know, I finally got to make music, you know, met my producer and just, you know, get to do things like this with people like you. It's fantastic. Yeah. That's good. Positive is, is a key word. Um, yeah. So do you, do you feel like after all these years of so long now, you've reached that peak that you're finally satisfied with, like the level? Or do you, do you think <laughs> that you, can, that you, you never, there's never such a thing as never keep ex aspiring. You can always, you know, dream for, you know, higher. Yeah, I, I will admit, you know, my producer and I have enjoyed, you know, some success. You know, we've had some some nice accolades and, you know, different awards and different, you know, chart popping songs. But to be honest, it, it's just it never stops. I mean, we're just changing musical direction. We're becoming more creative. As an example, my first, I think, five songs were more in that kind of country rock Americana world. Mm. And then the next couple of songs, you know, Radiate and I Got a Song were more in that alt pop rock world. And then in the summertime, I released a reggae rock song, which is around like the police vibe, that like reggae rock vibe that they did. And then just a week or two ago, I released a club lounge remix of one of my songs, Radiate. Yeah. So, Danny, I'm just exploring and having fun. And as a matter of fact, my next release, which is October 18th, is completely different. It's like a modern hard rock reminiscent of like um, Linkin Park and Evanescence and that kind of music. So to answer your question, have we peaked? Nope. <laughs> We're still going, making music, changing direction because it's so much fun just to write and play what you feel. And we'll see how it goes. Seems like you're enjoying the ride so far. And it's good to do a bit of fusion with rock music. The sky's the limit. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, rock by in and of itself is a fusion of how many different genres of music back in the early days, you know, the Delta Boys back in those days. And so we're just having fun. I just write what I feel. And some songs lend themselves to a certain genre based on the theme, the words, maybe the phrasing. And some songs are just meant for other genres. So the ones I did before fit the genre that we recorded them in. But now the ones moving forward are just more in that kind of hard modern rock world. Hmm. And then after that, Danny, I have no idea where we're going to go. We're going to keep going and maybe do something different. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Keep it flowing. Keep it flowing. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned one of your singles that you're currently promoting recently of late is called Radiate. You mentioned you did a, um, a lounge club remix with uh, with Zara Bellum. How did this occur? Yeah. So my song Radiate actually um, was released last year. I, th I think last October, something like that. Um, and it did pretty well on some of the charts. It actually made it up to number 41, I believe, on Cashbox Magazine's, you know, Pop Rock Top 100, which was just amazing for me. I never, ever dreamed of anything like that, like, like that happening. Then what happened was a producer uh, named D-Ray, D-Ray the producer is his name, uh, who works for, who owned the company called Soul Resurrection Music. Mm -hmm. He heard the song and then messaged me and said, hey, I like that song. Would you be interested in doing a lounge club remix? And Danny, honestly, I, I never even considered anything like that. Just not my world. However, I thought to myself, why would I, why would I decline that offer? When a producer that from Charlotte, North Carolina, hears one of your songs, wants to do a remake, you say yes. <laughs> so yeah. me and him and my current producer, Bob, got together and we made this Radiate Cerebellum remix, which was so much fun to do. So much fun to do. So yeah, that's how that came about. Just you know, another producer heard yeah. the song and, and wanted to do something. And I said, yes. Oh, that's good. I know dance music is like a genre in, in its own form. It swept the world. Uh, what's it like hearing your, your music in a club? Have you been in that situation before? Like, is there many bars or clubs where you are? No, not not yet. I haven't been that fortunate. No, I mean, I've been played on many, many thousands of radio stations, but I've never been in a situation where like I'm listening and I hear myself. No, yeah. never. I'm not sure if I ever will, but that would be a really amazing yeah. event if that ever happened. Yeah, Who knows? amazing. Um, and when you write to music, where do you draw your inspiration from, you know, when you create a music? You know, you've heard the expression, you know, music is the sound of emotion, right? And, and I use the hashtag music is my therapy pretty much everywhere I go. So for me, writing music is, is, is my therapy. I, mm. If I have a feeling good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, I have to write about it. I will say COVID because I had the time and the material, like I said, COVID without going into the details was pretty unkind to my family. So I had a lot of material to write about, but to be honest, like my writing style is a wreck. I mean, Danny, it's a mess. I'm the guy that wakes up at you know, two in the morning and like with a chorus or just an idea or a melody. And I desperately try to grab my phone and, you know, sing into the phone or, or type in lyrics. And it's hilarious when I try to decipher it. 
the next morning because it's a it's a mess. It's not in key. The words are all misspelled. So for me, it's like those lightning bolt moments. So inspiration comes like almost out of nowhere. Yeah. I get these lightning bolt moments. And honestly, in like a day or two, the song's pretty much done. Now, maybe I change a word or two. Maybe the phrasing changes a little bit, but really it's just kind of that fast. And then I kind of have to wait for the next one and I never know when it's going to come, but I have so many songs written in my book. I still write in a book uh, that my producer and I have a lot of work to do for many, many years. And that when composing, put music together, songwriting, lyrics and everything, and um, of course you go to the recording studio. Do you find that element a bit of escapism and tranquilizing as well? Yeah, I like I like getting it down. I mean, it's one thing to write it in the book and then, you know, I sit there with my acoustic guitar and kind of work it out. But when you actually transfer it into like the medium from the recording studio and now you have this like physical, tangible copy of, of your art. Oh, my gosh, it's, it's amazing to put that into something. And then whenever you release it, like I never thought I would ever release music for people to hear. For me, I was the guy in the corner just writing and playing for fun. Again, music is my therapy. But man, when you put songs out there that you know people listen to, oh my gosh, it's such an amazing feeling. I'm so fortunate that you know some people do listen to my music. I'm so fortunate. Yeah. It makes me very happy. Yeah. Do you ever get those pinch me moments where you wake up in the morning and you have to keep pinching yourself? I actually did. So recently um, I was at an awards ceremony, um, ISSA, yeah. uh, International Singer Songwriters Association, a couple of weeks ago. And I went just for the fun of it. It was my first time ever going. I was new to the organization and I was nominated in a few categories, which was great. I, I just wanted to go and experience it. And then they called my name up on stage to win an award. So talk about a pinch me moment. I would, the funny story is I was actually filming another musician who I thought his name was gonna be called. And then they called my name. So he had to get his phone. He's filming me as I'm filming him. So talk about pinch me moments. Yeah, getting an award, uh, for Emerging Artist of 2024 for ISSA was definitely a huge pinch me moment. Yes, yes. It just goes to show, doesn't it? I did catch um, the red carpet of you, you know, you, you're chatting, you know, with, you know, yeah. the presenters. Uh, was that a good experience? Yeah, I tell you what, ISSA, you know, run by Tammany Dove and, and the whole organization, the ISSA radio, they do so much to make people like me feel just so good. It's almost kind of like, you know, the Grammys for us independent artists. And there's a red carpet, there's interviews, there's photos, there's pre-parties, there's post-parties. They do a lot of work to help people like us just feel motivated and give that little bit of accolade that just kind of makes you want to go again and again. And I got to meet so many of my, what I call my musical family, and even some of my musical heroes. I mean, you talk about pinch me. Some of these people I've spoken to on the computer, like I'm doing to you, but now I actually got to meet them, mm -hmm. shake their hands, you know, give a bro hug, you know, share time. And they were actually real. <laughs> and it was so cool. And I, I can't wait to get there. It's every August, I believe is the ceremony. So if, if all goes well, and my mother always says, you know, God willing and the creeks don't rise, I will be at that show every single August. Sounds good. And I know you've released a string of singles like over the years. Um, do you like releasing singles um, or do you like doing albums as well? Let's say is there an album in the pipeline you uh, would like to share or announce? Yeah, that's a good question. So I think for me, you know, I've only been releasing music now for, I guess, three years, 21, I guess. Yeah, about three years. I'm not sure. I mean, I could I do have some songs that could be a cohesive output, like maybe an EP or something mm -hmm. like that. I don't know. I, I just kind of want to keep building the singles, you know, kind of build the audience. And maybe when I get to a certain point where I have an audience that maybe is hungry for a cohesive piece of work, yeah, maybe I'll consider something like that. But right now I'm having so much fun doing singles. I, I was doing singles every four months. I was with a record company uh, for last year and we were doing um, a single every four months. I'm not with the record company anymore. So now I'm going to do a single every six weeks. I have so much music to get out. And I thought, you know, my, my gray hair is getting more and more prevalent. Danny, what am I waiting for? Yeah. <laughs> I want to put music out and hopefully people want to listen to it. So I'm going to keep doing singles every six weeks. Yeah. And when the time comes to maybe make a change, maybe we'll make a change. That's good. That's fair enough. Uh, say when the time is right, you might have to, uh, put out a collection of songs. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on vinyl coming back as well? They seem to be really popular. I know they're expensive, but, uh, you know, vinyls, you know, it's good to see young people holding a vinyl in their hand. Oh, my, I mean, of course, my generation, I'm not ashamed to say I'm 54 years old. So vinyl's all I had growing up. I mean, I had such a collection and I gave my collection away to my family when I was younger. When the CDs came out, I did not have the foresight 
to think that vinyl might come back one day. I was a kid when CDs came out. I think I was, what CDs, maybe 1986, 87, I don't know, somewhere around there. I was in high school. So I got rid of all my vinyl and I have zero vinyl to this day. Now, as you suggested, it's all coming back. So there's a part of me that wants to buy a turntable and like buy like the top 100 albums, if they're even in existence, that I always listened to like growing up. I would love to kind of get back into that, into that. But to be honest, I haven't done it just yet, but I'm happy that it sounds like it might be more available. I'm not sure how many people are actually putting out vinyl of the old stuff. Mm. I mean, some of the new stuff is coming out on vinyl, yeah. but I'd like to get back into that hobby because there's just nothing like putting that needle on that record, man. Yeah. Like hearing that little scratch and then the sound comes out. Oh, <laughs> It's quite frightening at home. I've got three truckloads of like, um, well, their, their vinyl of like club classics, you know, dance oh. music from late oh, 80s, man. 90s to 2000s. And I can't put a price in it. You know, if someone wants to offer me money for it, it's priceless. You can't put the, the uh, price on the vinyl, really. Collectors, oh, my goodness. Yeah, my next door neighbor uh, is an ex-Philadelphia DJ. So he was a club <sighs> DJ for years in Philadelphia. Danny, he has thousands upon thousands of records yeah. in crates, all protected, that he used to DJ with. And it's kind of the same idea. He just, he should probably sell them and get rid of them, but he just can't. <laughs> he just <laughs> cannot do it. Maybe someday, but yeah, he has one heck of a collection of them. Amazing. Um, do you do music videos as well? Do you like to be a bit adventurous with that side creatively, you know, um, say doing a music video on YouTube? Yeah, I've done some music videos without like me being in them, just, you know, going through different footage and you know, a lot of it's stock footage. There's so much video out there that's royalty free. I made a video for Radiate. Uh, some friends did a ra uh, video for My Way. But to be honest, I'm not really sure. And you know this, it, it seems like the, the three and a half, four minute, five minute long, you know, full song videos are almost kind of obsolete. Everyone does the reels and the shorts and the attention spans of the next generation is like that big where I used to love, you know, concept videos. So I don't know, man, I, I, I've been asked that before and I don't know if a full video is in my future mm -hmm. other than, you know, using the different royalty free sites to put something together that's yeah. kind of cohesive that matches with the lyrics. I've done a couple of those. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I think it'd be fun, a lot of fun to do like a real video, but man, there's a lot of time, energy costs involved. And I'm not sure if you get much of a return anymore. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I wish I could answer, but I don't know. <laughs> Sometimes you just can't beat, you know, put in a video of a live performance on. Yeah, yeah that would be a trip. I mean, that mm. kind of thing is very, very different. That would be amazing. Maybe in the future, again, I'm I'm, I'm not close to anything. I, I just want to do whatever gets my music out there, whatever gets me heard. I'm willing to try. Yeah, that's good. Um, next question for you now. Um, you mentioned, like, you know, um, you know, the bars and, you know, where you are um, in... Um, uh, Pennsylvania um do you like to frequent open mic nights as well where you live you know where check out local talent oh yeah there's there's a couple that go on and I tell you what a lot of these open mics I mean again it's like people like me that maybe have been writing and playing for years and maybe they really haven't done anything I don't want to say professionally but like mm. put music out but it doesn't mean that they don't have phenomenal songs and, and great songwriting so I have gone to quite a few there's a couple local bars that do it a couple small little restaurants that even have a little stage where I've done it and people have done it. And some of the music you hear is pretty fantastic, but not everybody goes through the process of recording and distributing and marketing and all that kind of stuff. That's a whole nother world. I mm -hmm. wish it were just as easy as having a great song. That's like 10, 20% of it. The rest of it is all this marketing and doing things like we're doing right now and podcasts and interviews. And not everybody wants to do that. They just want to yeah. go to the local bar, play a couple songs and call it a day. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing mm -hmm. wrong with it. Do you do a few gigs yourself locally, um, stateside, within your states, like tours? So when I was with my record company, there was a couple different tours going on. And you have to kind of wait your time a little bit to get slated into the tours. And I was kind of the next one in line. And then different things went on and I didn't renew my contract. So now I'm kind of like back to zero. So in the near future, no, I have nothing going on other than like little things that I do. But all I'm going to do is just keep making music. That's the most important mm -hmm. part. I just want to keep making music, putting it out. Whatever comes after that would, would be gravy. Yeah. Another question for you. Another track you released was called Dance With Your Shadow. That's an interesting uh, song title. What's the um, kind of the backstory behind this one? Is it is it a new record? Has it been out for some time? Yeah, so Dance came out... Uh, july just this summer 
And that was kind of my summertime, you know, reggae rock jam. So, so when I wrote, I wrote that a long, long time ago, I wrote that decades ago, honestly. Um, and then kind of, I was thinking of like the different ways I wanted to make music. I was listening to a lot of the police and I was going back to the early catalogs of the police. And I was reading about how Sting and the police were, you know, very, very uh, influential or the, the Jamaican music coming over in the 60s and 70s into London was kind of influencing Sting and the police and the music scene. And I thought, well, you know, not many people do that reggae rock vibe. So I wanted to kind of go back in time, kind of evoke that sort of police reggae rock vibe, but then couple it with like a big chorus, like a big nickelback chorus, if you will. So my producer and I went back and forth and that's kind of where Dance With Your Shadow came from. The whole theme of the song was about a beach experience I had um, in the Gulf of Thailand many, many years ago. So it kind of lent itself to that kind of mm -hmm. reggae summer vibe. So that's why we put that whole reggae rock you know, vibe into it. I wanted to do it in the chorus and not in the verse. And my producer was like, no, no, we got to do it in the verse and then come in with the big chorus. So he was right. So that's kind of a newer release. Um, it was so much fun to, to write and play. And it's very, very different playing that reggae rock vibe versus like a rock vibe. You come in on the two, not the one. It's a, just a different feeling, you know, yeah. but it was so much fun. And I have a couple more songs that probably will fit that vibe in the future. Not anytime soon, but there'll be more probably like that. But well, we'll check that one out. And I, I heard an Englishman in New York um, yesterday for the first time in a while. And I just love the breakdown in that song, you know, when you've got the jazz and then you've got the kind of reggae and then Sting's doing his kind of like thing as well. And you say like Roxanne as well. It's got that kind of fusion sound, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to try something. I, I For whatever reason, and a lot of songwriters will tell you this they'll write based on whatever they're listening to kind of at that moment. So when I was putting that together, I happened to be listening to the old police songs and I thought, holy cow, this fits perfectly. And that's just how it happened. That's simple. Yeah. A couple more questions to go. I uh, just uh, going to wrap it up shortly, but I just wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned the police uh, sting being inspirational to you. Um, I know Bruce Springsteen celebrated his uh, 75th birthday, literally mm -hmm. the other day, the other week. Any of our bands or singers uh, who have inspired your music otherwise as well? Oh, boy. Gosh. Yeah, there's been a lot. There was one particular musician um, who just recently passed away a couple of years ago. I don't remember exactly when. Um, his name was David Crosby. You probably know from Crosby, Stills and Nash, Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. So David Crosby was my favorite musician for I don't even know how long, as long as I've been listening to music. And I always thought, man, I would love an opportunity to, if I had a wish in this world to like sit in a room with David Crosby and, you know, play maybe a couple bars of, of one of my songs and let him put like one part harmony on the top of that. Oh my goodness, that would be a, a dream come true. But so he was always a big inspiration, just the way they did the three part harmonies. And I always put harmonies into my choruses. I, lo I love the idea of harmonizing. So he was one of my favorites. He left us, you know, not too long ago, but that was a big blow. But yeah, that was a big influence for me was David Crosby, the whole right. Crosby still Nash kind of kind of movement. Sure. Uh, one final question I've got to ask you, where's best to follow you on social media? You know, those platforms and, and any official websites you may like to share. Yeah, so I do have a website. That's my band name, Michael Bate Band. And the good news is that every social media site there is, it's Michael Bate Band. The good news is that when you distribute music, whatever distributor you use, they put it on every platform on earth so it's michael bate band the only difference is twitter because it was too long so twitter it's m bate band but i don't, I don't use twitter too much for music i mean the radio shows i, I talk to the radio shows via twitter but really it's michael bate b-o-t-t -T yeah. band is everywhere great well love to chat with you today michael the interviews go so fast also me to do is uh play your new record on my show is it radiate you would like wish for me to spin uh, you could do, are you doing the, the remix or the original? It's up yeah. to you. Yeah, which, which we do the remix. That sounds Sure, why not? Man? That'd be fun. That'd be Great. Fun. Well, thanks very much for joining me today. And I really wish you well in your new direction. All right. Thank you so much for the time. I appreciate you. Thank you. No problem. It's a pleasure. Michael Botte band on my show today.